bring your greetings, pastors, church leaders, evangelists, Bible college students. I greet you in the name of Jesus, our Savior, and by the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm praying that God was, is going to bless you greatly during this session as we talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the second most important gift that God wants to give to every believer apart from salvation. My name is Frank Parrish. I am the director of World Missionary Assistance Plan called World Map. Uh, I've been directing that ministry for the last 15 years. It's a global leadership training ministry, and we are serving pastors and leaders in over 150 nations. It is a great privilege to be serving our brethren, you, as you seek to fulfill the call that God has placed upon your life. And today, we are going to talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. A very, very important gift that God wants to give to you. And so before we start, what I would like for you to do, if you would please, is that you would simply fold up your notebooks and your pens and your Bibles and you would set them aside. And if you would extend your hands out towards the Lord, just the same way you would put your hands out to receive a gift, because I believe that today you are going to receive a gift. And let's pray together, shall we? Father, in the name of Jesus, our Savior, we thank you that you give good gifts to your people, to your sons and daughters. I thank you that you have an extraordinary gift to give to us, and that is the gift of the Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, we invite you with our open hearts that are open and flexible and teachable, we invite you, come fill us today. Come be a gift in our lives today. We ask in the mighty name of Jesus, for his glory, his sake, and his honor. And can you say with me, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, as I said to you, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is probably the second greatest gift that God wants to give to every believer apart from salvation. And the reason why is because we live in a world that is the same as it was 2,000 years ago. There is the same kind of broken relationships, the same kind of drug addiction and alcoholism and sexual addictions and people that are broken by sin, people that are hurting, that are diseased and need healing. And the solution for their lives is not a religion. It's not just a set of beliefs and things that they try to comfort themselves with. What they need is power, real power. And what separates Christianity from all the other religions of the world is the power presence of God. And he comes to us through the Holy Spirit. In Christianity, there is the, that's the only place that you can have salvation by faith and the true power of the Holy Spirit that can deliver the alcoholic and drug addict, that can save the person whose life is desperately broken, that can put back together a marriage that has been devastated by sin, only through the power of the Holy Spirit. And there's something else that's happening that is extremely significant in our world today. Right now, over 80,000 people are coming to Christ every 24 hours. Can you imagine such a thing? Every 24 hours, 80,000 people are becoming Christians. They are converting from all other religions, and they are coming to Christ because they recognize in Christianity there is a God who loves them, because that's a, he's a God who's there. And he gives them the power of the Holy Spirit to live a victorious life every day. It's by his Holy Spirit. And Jesus is beckoning, calling people to come to him every day. And the people that God is using most to bring others to Christ is those who are filled with the Holy Spirit. Because you see, people don't want religion. There is enough religion to go around. And it offers no real solutions. What they want is something that can transform their lives. And that can only happen by the power of the Holy Spirit. And God is using those people who are full of the Holy Spirit to bring others to Christ. In fact, God is doing miraculous things through the lives of people who are filled with His Spirit. And it's not the person. It's not their gifting. It's not their stature. It's not their education. It is not anything else but the power of the Holy Spirit resident within the life of a believer. And God has called you, brothers. God has called you, and he's chosen you. You have a calling from God to fulfill that call, to fulfill being chosen. You need to be equipped. And the equipping that God wants to give you is the equipping of the Holy Spirit. 
We can have many things in our lives, but if we don't have the Holy Spirit, everything else is simply not as powerful. It's good to be educated. It's good to understand the Scripture. It is good to be gifted. It is good to be trained. But with the power of the Holy Spirit igniting those gifts, we become a real ambassador for Christ in our world, a a choice tool that God can use as he works his great things in the world today. And God wants to use you. You are his chosen tool. So God wants to give you a gift today. It's called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, there may be some of you who have already been baptized with the Holy Spirit, and we're going to talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, what that is, what it's not, how that functions, how we can receive it. There may be some of you who have not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And my prayer is, by the end of these sessions on the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that you will have received that gift, because God wants to give it to you. And this I know about our Father in heaven. He loves us so much, he doesn't have unnecessary gifts to give us. Everything that he gives us, he sees as the all-wise, all-knowing, all-powerful God, he sees we need that gift. And more than anything else, we need the gift of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So let's talk about that. Let's study that today and look into what the Bible reveals about the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit and the promise of the Holy Spirit to be given to us is not a last-minute idea on God's part. As a matter of fact, he's been planning the gift of the Holy Spirit for thousands of years. In fact, he has seen you from time eternity. He's seen you at this session right now, getting ready to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So in the Old Testament, we see that the Holy Spirit was present. He was active from the very beginning in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. The Spirit of God was present. The Spirit of God was present as he moved and worked throughout the history of the Old Testament, throughout the history of the Jewish people. He came upon prophets and kings of the Old Testament. He accomplished great works, great deeds. And we'll discuss more about that later in a teaching on anointing. Father God also prophesied that he was sending the Spirit to us all the way back with Moses in Numbers chapter 11, verse 29. Moses says, oh, that all God's people were prophets and the Lord would put his spirit upon them. And Moses was speaking under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and he was actually speaking prophetically because God was planning on bringing the Holy Spirit to them. Also, then he speaks in Ezekiel 37 and 47. He gives us some prophetic foretypes in Scripture of the the gift of the Holy Spirit. In Ezekiel 37, he talks about the dry bones. And the question is asked, can these dry bones live? And it says, by God's Spirit, he begins to breathe life, that breath of God, breathing life, and even to what is dead. Let me just say, pastors, I've been in ministry for... Uh, almost 40 years now, and I know that there are times um, when I was a youth pastor or an associate pastor, I pioneered a church, I was a senior pastor, there were times where spiritually I just felt so empty and drained and powerless, and I needed a touch from the Holy Spirit, and that's what God wants to give us. Can these dry bones live? No matter where you're at in ministry right now, no matter what is happening to you, the power and life and grace of the Holy Spirit can breathe life into you and into your ministry, into your home, your relationship with your wife and your family. How many of you need a fresh breath of God in your life? We all do. Also, in Ezekiel 47, there is another prophetic foretype where we are given the picture of a river. And again, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was often represented by fire, by wind, by water. We see some of the same symbols in the New Testament. Well, God uses one of those symbols to represent the Holy Spirit in Ezekiel chapter 47, where we see this flowing river, and he calls the prophet, come, come get in the river. And so Ezekiel kind of puts his toe out and sticks his toe in, and yeah, it's okay, and then he gets a little deeper and a little deeper, and finally he goes to the place where he is fully submerged in the river. And it is such a wonderful picture of the Holy Spirit. 
I don't want a little bit of the Holy Spirit. I don't need a little bit of power. I want all of the Holy Spirit to fill my life and to fill the ministry that God has assigned me to fulfill. And you, brothers and sisters, you're going to need the power of the Holy Spirit to fulfill the ministry God has given you. You can have buildings. You can have uh, all kinds of leadership uh, around you. You can have great programs. But it is the power of the Holy Spirit that literally transforms lives. And you and I can rely on many things. But what I've seen in my years of ministry and as I travel around the world, it is the pastors and leaders that rely primarily upon the power of the Holy Spirit in their outreaches, in their services, in their one-on-one ministry and counseling that have the power of the Spirit literally transform the lives of people. And that is a thing, that is a gift that God wants to give to you is that power, that very real presence of God. And so God had been planning all the way along for the gift of the Holy Spirit to be given. And then, of course, we read in Joel 2, the prophecy in Joel 2, that then Peter repeats on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 about the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, that God says, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. And as my sons and daughters shall prophesy and see visions and have dreams. And the, as you look at the prophecy, you realize it's not limited to a certain group of people. It is for every single person who calls upon the name of the Lord. And this teaching for you today is not only to help you as a pastor and a leader to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, but I urge you, if you want to be an effective leader, a leader that bears much fruit, as John 15 encourages us to do. The way to do that is to teach your people the baptism of the Holy Spirit and lead them into receiving that gift. That will transform their lives, and they then will become agents of transformation wherever they go. Hallelujah. So that is one of the ways that we can be very fruitful leaders in the body of Christ. So now we pick up our narrative. We've seen that the Holy Spirit was promised as a gift in the Old Testament. Now we're still in the New Testament, or still in the Old Testament, even though this story is recorded in the, Old Te- in, in the New Testament. It is about John the Baptist. John the Baptist prophesied about the Messiah's coming and his mission. He says in John chapter 1, verses 32 to 33, And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove and remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water, God did that, gave John his commission to do that, said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. You see, Christ's mission was not just to go to the cross, to teach and to go to the cross, be resurrected and ascend. Part of his job was to send the Holy Spirit to us. And even now, to this day, there is one who baptizes us with the Holy Spirit. It's not me. It's not some other human. The person who baptizes us with the Holy Spirit is Jesus Christ himself. And he wants to give you the gift of the Holy Spirit. Jesus then promised the overflowing presence of the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 7, verses 37 to 39, he says, On the last day of this great feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. And he who believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So in the Old Testament, we see the Holy Spirit active. He was active in the life of Jesus, in the ministry of Jesus. Jesus, when he was baptized by John, was baptized in the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit remained upon him. John prophesied and said, this is the one who will baptize us with the Holy Spirit and with fire in Matthew chapter 3. That Spirit of God was active, but he had not yet been given to all those who call upon the name of the Lord. And so when Jesus was finishing his ministry, he'd been 
He'd been crucified. He'd been raised from the dead by the power of the Spirit, Romans 8, 11. Then he commands his disciples. He appears to his disciples, and he says to them in Luke chapter 24, 49, he says, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. So what was Jesus saying at this moment? He was saying to his disciples, look, I have accomplished the the major part of what God has assigned for me to do, but I have one further gift to give you, and that is the Holy Spirit. And I don't want you to go back to fishing. I don't want you to go back to your father's work, your father's house. I want you to stay in Jerusalem until the power of the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And he knew that that day was coming very quickly. And again, he says to his disciples just before the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 1, verse 5, he says, For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not so many days from now. And he goes on to say in in the 8th verse of the same first chapter of Acts, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the absolute ends of the earth. I went to India. The first time I went to India, the brethren there took me to the place where Thomas, yes, doubting Thomas of the disciples of Jesus, where he actually came, preached the gospel. Many were saved, performed absolute wondrous miracles, and then was martyred for his faith. You see, Thomas went all the way to the uttermost parts of the earth in his day, and the Holy Spirit led him there. God has great things that he wants to do through you. But it's not going to happen because you've gotten a prophecy. It's not going to happen because you really want to. Your heart is good. You really want to serve the Lord. To fulfill those great things that God has spoken and wants to do through you, it will take power, real power. Not the power of a denomination or the power of an education, as good as those things may be, it will take the power of the living God working in and through you by his spirit. And the great news is, God wants to give that to you. And it was not just a gift that was poured out on the day of Pentecost, because that's where the promise begins. In Jerusalem, so many had gathered together to celebrate. Many of the Jews had gathered for the celebration of Pentecost. And in that moment, there's 120 disciples That's all the followers that were remaining faithful to Jesus at that moment, just 120. And they were in an upper room. And it says that they were praying, they were waiting on God. And I know sometimes the Scripture does not reveal how human the people are (laughs) that it talks about in Scripture. But when you look closely, think about yourself in that upper room. I don't know if they were all full of faith and just ready to take on the world for Christ their Savior, personally, I think they were scared out of their minds. I think they were confused. They weren't sure what was happening or what they were going to do or what this power from on high was. They had no idea. And so they were gathered together, probably hiding, probably wondering when the, someone's going to bang on the door and say, you're all under arrest for being followers of Jesus. And they were waiting. God, you've told us, Jesus, you said we're going to receive this power. So here we are. We're waiting. And then Scripture says in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 39, we read the story. Suddenly, there came a sound from heaven like a mighty rushing wind, tongues of fire upon their heads. And they were all filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit. And they begin to speak in tongues, tongues that they didn't know. Most of the disciples were uneducated men, but they begin to speak in other tongues. There were others around them who said, we're hearing the great and mighty works of God spoken in our language because there were Jews from all over the world who had come to celebrate Pentecost, and they're hearing their own language. And I think two miracles were happening at that point. I think there was the miracle of speaking in another tongue that they didn't know, and there was the miracle of hearing as well. Because there were those there present who said, no, they're drunk. That's just some kind of emotional craziness. Ah, 
Don't pay any attention to them. But truly, they were encountering the power of God. And there were miracles already beginning to take place. And in that moment, Peter stands up and he preaches the sermon, quoting Joel chapter 2, the prophecy of Joel chapter 2. And you might think, I've preached better sermons than that one. You know, I have. I've all my all my points lined up with the, the same letter, and I had great illustrations and all kinds of good stuff going on. But when Peter preached this sermon, 3,000 people came to Christ. Wow! How did that happen? Was it a good homiletics course that he took? No. It was the power of the Holy Spirit speaking and functioning through Peter, who had just been baptized with the Holy Spirit. That is the same Spirit that God wants to give you and I. He wants to pour his Spirit out upon us. Hallelujah! Can you say hallelujah where you are? What a wonderful thing to receive such a great gift from God. And so the promise begins in Acts chapter 2. And that's when the Holy Spirit was poured out. Now, it's very important to understand this. The day of Pentecost will not ever happen again. For the first time in all of human history, in the history of our universe, as far as we know, the Holy Spirit was poured out upon this planet and poured out upon all those who are willing to receive. So that day of Pentecost will never occur again. Just like the cross, Jesus' crucifixion, his death at the cross, paying for our sins, atoning for our sin, that will never happen again. And that is a one-time occurrence in eternity as far as we know. However, looking at the cross and what was accomplished there, paying for our sin, appeasing the wrath of God and the judgment of God so that we might come to faith in Christ as a free gift given to us by him. But each of us must personally appropriate that gift. The cross happened one time in a moment of time. The, the, I would say the corner of time in the history of this planet, our, our world went around a corner at the cross. But we must personally appropriate that gift from God. In the same way, the day of Pentecost will never occur like the cross. But also in the same way, we must personally appropriate the gift of what is promised in Pentecost. And there is a promise to us that is given to us in Pentecost that is so wonderful. It is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. God has ordained and desires for every believer to be baptized with his Holy Spirit. Well, let's look for a few moments a little more closely about what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is and is not so that we begin to gain a better understanding. So what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Well, first let's talk about what it is not. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not salvation. Do When people receive Christ at salvation, when they are born again, they must be born again by the Holy Spirit. There is no other way. And every believer who names the name of Jesus has the Holy Spirit within them. But that's not the same as the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we'll, I'll show you that in Scripture. Jesus says in John 3, 5, and 6, you must be born again and you must be born of the Spirit. For that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And so we, we see again in John 4, 13 to 14, Jesus said, whoever drinks, this is the woman at the well. You guys all know this story. Jesus says to her, whoever drinks of this water, well, in other words, the well water, will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become like a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Jesus was referring to salvation. In a few moments, I'll read you another scripture where he talks about the Holy Spirit. So he's referring to salvation. We must be born by the Spirit. The Samaritans in Acts chapter 8, Paul in Acts chapter 9, the Ephesians in Acts chapter 19, all were saved. They, were, they loved Jesus, they were saved by faith, they were walking for Jesus, they, they were obedient to Jesus, but that none of them had been baptized with the Holy Spirit in all three of those instances, Acts 8, Acts 9, Acts 19, after they were born again, they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. What that reveals to us is that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is distinct from salvation. 
Secondly, it is not sanctification. Sanctification is a large theological word that simply means that we have been separated unto God, and secondly, that God is remaking us into his image. And that is a lifetime-long work. I received Jesus over 42 years ago, and it's going to be another long set of years that Jesus is going to continue to work in me by his Holy Spirit to make me more like Jesus. And every day, every day I become more like Jesus as I walk in obedience to the, to the Word and to the Holy Spirit. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not sanctification. It is distinct from that. Both of these works are done by the Holy Spirit. But one is meant for a lifetime, progressive, long work. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is a sudden moment where the Holy Spirit fills to overflowing the life of a believer. It is also not a second work of grace. This term came to be used back in the 1700s. It actually was, uh, it's considered to be a heresy, the second work of grace, even though there are some people who still believe it today. There's no support for it in Scripture. The second work of grace is about having entire sanctification this side of heaven. Now, what we see and what the New Testament teaches throughout the whole New Testament is that sanctification is a lifelong process where we are being sanctified, and then someday when we see Jesus face to face, we will be completely free of sin. We will be fully sanctified. But that is on the other side of heaven, not this side of heaven. So what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Well, the first thing we need to do is we need to look at the word baptism. It's the Greek word baptizo. That word means a full immersion. Uh, Unfortunately, the history of the word, when they did the King James Bible, they did not want to say immersion because at that time they baptized people by sprinkling uh, for a variety of reasons. But the word baptizo in Scripture means a full immersion, a complete immersion, and it's used about baptism in water. It's also used concerning the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And this is a very significant word. Imagine with me, if you will, having a bucket full of water. And you take a glass, and you can take that glass and kind of move it around and put a little bit of water in it from that bucket and, and have a little bit of water in it. And then you say, well, there's water from that bucket in the glass. It's genuine water. It's true water. You could drink that water. It's good water. But there's only a little bit of it. But think with me for a moment. If you took that glass and you plunged it down to the very bottom of that bucket, and not only is the glass completely covered on the outside with water, it is totally full to overflowing with water. And that is the image and the picture of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It is a full, complete immersion into the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit not only covering us on the outside, but filling us to overflowing on the outside. He is literally flowing out of us. And so that's what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is all about. A full, complete, overflowing filling of the Holy Spirit. I know if I'm very, very thirsty, I don't want a little sip of water. I want a big glass of water. If I'm hot and sweaty, I want to dive into the water. I don't want to just stick my toe in. And so the Holy Spirit knows how dry and thirsty we are spiritually, and he wants to give us a full immersion, a full infilling and overflowing of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. So now in Scripture, when we look at the word baptism of the Holy Spirit and we examine it throughout uh, the passages of Scripture, we see that there are many different terms that are used to describe and to emphasize the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that experience of being completely infilled and overflowing. And so some of these words, I will give them to you very quickly with a scripture reference for you to look at later. Baptized with the Holy Spirit, Mark, uh, Matthew 3.11 and Acts 1.5. Receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit, Acts 2.38. God giving the Holy Spirit, Acts 5.32 and 8, 1 through 8. Receiving the Holy Spirit, Acts 8.15 and 10.47. The Holy Spirit falling on the believer, Acts 8.16, 10.44, The Holy Spirit coming upon the believer, Acts 19.6. Holy Spirit poured upon believers, Acts 2.17, 18, and 10.45. The, the uh, 
individual being clothed with the Holy Spirit. Uh, Luke 24, 49, being filled with the Holy Spirit, Acts 2, 4, 4, 31, and Ephesians 5, 18. All of this describes, all these different words God uses to describe and emphasize not only the importance, but a picture of how the Holy Spirit comes upon us. Now, this very, very important gift is a gift with a purpose. And that purpose is to make us witnesses for the Lord. Acts 1.8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses even to the uttermost parts of the earth. It is also the power to release the miraculous through our lives. In Acts, all throughout the book of Acts, and in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14, we see the miracle gifts of God that are ignited by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it also gives us power for living as a kingdom representative. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20, we are called ambassadors for Christ. We are not secret agents for the kingdom of God. We are wide-open public ambassadors. And what brings people to Christ is not just the testimony of who Christ is in us, but by them seeing the power of the risen Christ through the Holy Spirit working through us. They are convinced that not only there is a God who is there, but he has power to transform their lives. This power for living and victory to give us victory over sin and temptation is a greater joy, brings us a greater joy, but it also brings us a greater responsibility. It deepens our passions for souls, gives us power and desire for prayer, a deeper love for Christ, a greater equipping in spiritual warfare and boldness with discernment, a deepened love and insight into God's precious and holy word. It also grants to us a deepened love for God's people. We care more about God's people. It ignites, as I've said before, the gifts of the Holy Spirit and gives us a fresh empowerment to use them for God's glory and for the edification of the church. And we'll talk more about the miracle gifts of God later. It also gives us power to fulfill our God-given assignments. If I took all of those things and wrapped them into one phrase, I would say this, that the baptism of the Holy Spirit gives us power for fruitful service in the kingdom of God. And God wants to give you this free gift because he loves you. In our next session, we're going to talk about who gets to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and a number of other things. I pray that God will speak to your heart and begin to produce within you a holy hunger for all his gifts that he has to give you because he loves you as your father and only wants to give you the very best gifts for a life of victory and fruitful service. God bless you.